Thank you so much, Kat Cocolette, for joining me. I really hope I pronounced your name right. <laughs> it was perfect. If you were okay, French, you might say Coquillette, but you know, as Americans, we just we get those L's in there. Cocolette. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for joining me uh, for this graphics gang chat. I'm really excited. Uh, to meet you. And I also have to say that our whole graphics gang, we're all such huge, huge fans of yours. Oh, thank um, you. And I personally, so I actually, uh, I have a graphic design background like you do. I kind of came at it from a different angle. Um, and for 16 years, I was a film and television graphic designer. Um, and I loved what I did um and you know before that I owned my own like small design firm or whatever but I loved what I did but uh you know that career is very fast-paced and sometimes not in a good way and very exhausting and you your days are definitely guaranteed to be 12 hours uh so you know I really loved it but I was really getting burnt out and, um, you know, I was in my 40s and, you know, I've obviously I've I know what graphic design is, but I never really knew what surface design was until I literally found you. <laughs> so awesome. Stacey Bloomfield is one of my mentors and I adore her. And of course, I love Bonnie, but you were my absolute number one, very first introduction into this amazing lifestyle. I mean, I won't even call it a career because it's it's so close to my heart that it's really my life. And a friend of mine told me about Skillshare. I had never heard of it. And she said, yeah, check out this teacher. Her name is Kat Cocolette. And I think the first class of yours that I watched was the, your intro to Procreate because I've been using Adobe forever and I, you know, have always just either done things by hand or, or an illustrator. And I was just so blown away with how approachable you are and how laid back and friendly and down to earth you are, but how you also know your stuff. So it was like, thank you. The perfect, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you were the perfect combination of like somebody I could relate to, but somebody I could also look up to where I want to be like, you were where I want to be, you know, 10 years ago. And I was like, you know, and I felt a little frustrated with myself, like, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm starting this a little late, but um, I, I advanced pretty quickly and I'm a really hard worker and fast learner. And I, then I just literally started taking like all of your classes <laughs> and uh, subscribe to your email newsletter. And I just, I love the way you approach uh, not just your craft but your students your community because you're really open and you share information and you're really encouraging you're not competitive um and so I just wanted to say thank you and uh that's my that, little like that was a hell of an intro I I don't know if I can that's woo. <laughs> <laughs> it's all true so thank you um, I, I really appreciate hearing that I do yeah so for those of you, or for those in the graphics gang who don't know you, which I doubt there is anyone, but just in case, um, do you want to do a quick introduction for yourself? Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Kat Cocolette, and my brand name is Kat Coke. I just shortened my last name since, I mean, you can pronounce it. Most of the world cannot. No one can spell it. So C-A-T-C-O-Q, um, which actually was a pretty good idea because it's very uh, Googleable. You know, it's very SEO friendly. Uh, it's the only brand named Cat Coke out there. But anyway, um, yeah, just quick intro. About 10 years ago, I was working at a design agency in Kansas City as a, uh, as a graphic designer. I was doing branding work. So um, art directing photo shoots, designing logos, websites, campaigns, you know, everything that goes into working at a small branding agency. But um, yeah, I've been living in Kansas City or Kansas, I should say, my entire life. Uh, I went to school at the University of Kansas. I got a job in Kansas City. And um, really, I just kind of thought that was my life trajectory. I thought like, oh, okay, I'll start here as a designer, then I'll become an art director, and then a creative director. And then maybe a partner and, you know, the whole, and then retire and then my life is over. But um, <laughs> what was happening was uh, I wasn't, <clears throat> sorry, I'm getting over pneumonia. So my throat is catching a little bit. Yep. I'm getting over COVID. So yeah. Okay. Yay for January. <laughs> oh my God. December was crazy. But anyway, yeah. So 
Um, yeah, so that was my career trajectory. But on the side, I started um, watercoloring, um, just things I was doing for fun. It wasn't to commercialize it. It was just like, I wanted to spend some time when I got home from work, not like not staring at a screen. So I would just watercolor like flowers or donuts or dogs or like whatever I just felt like painting as a sort of creative release. And um, yeah, I started uploading those paintings to Instagram. And which was kind of the catalyst for me growing my first audience. Um, it wasn't a fast grow. It was a slow grow over years. Um, and then I also started scanning in those watercolor paintings I was doing um, and then uploading them to print on demand sites. So I started with Society6. And that was like the big move that completely pivoted my, not just my career, my entire life, because this was way back in 2014, where that POD space was a lot less saturated and I just had some 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 bestsellers right off the bat. Uh, I was it was very lucky. And what happened within six months is I was earning more on Society Six through those royalties than I was at my full time job. So, still took me about a year and a half, two years to quit that job though, because you know the the uncertainty of just leaving a job that I thought was a career for my entire life and then doing you know my own thing, which I didn't know what surface design, I didn't know the term surface design, I didn't know the term art licensing. Um, I had to Google to learn what royalties were, like this whole, you know, new sphere was was completely new for me. So yeah, what I started doing was finding other print on demand websites, uploading my artwork through them. Uh, I eventually quit my job and bought a one-way ticket to Thailand. And I was like, you know what, if I'm going to go nuclear, I'm just going to go total nuclear on my life. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I decided I wanted to be a digital nomad because the only thing I really needed to do my job was I needed art supplies, uh, computer scanner, and an internet connection. So yeah, quit my job in Kansas City, ended my lease, put all my belongings in my brother's basement, and uh, flew to Thailand and kind of started a new life there. So that was, gosh, I think that was seven or eight years ago. Eight years ago, we're in 2024 now. Um, yeah, and I've just been traveling the world ever since. So what started as my only income being print on demand has now expanded in these eight-ish years to um, a lot of other stuff. Art licensing is kind of the bread and butter of my business. Um, what that means is I create artwork and then I license it out to companies who want to turn it into products like wallpaper, art, art, art prints, pillows, like literally any product, you name it. Um, yeah. And then at some point I started teaching online classes and it was just kind of a one-off, you know, I was like, oh, I'll just do one class. Uh, Society6 asked me to do a class with Skillshare teaching other people about the print on demand space. And um, at the time, Society6 was my primary income source. So I was just like, if you say dance monkey, I'll dance, you know, it's like anything <laughs> they tell me to do, I'll do it. Um, but no, I was also curious about it. I was like, yeah, let's see what it looks like if I go, if I go uh, teach a class. And I, um, I hated the process of being filmed. It was like really nerve wracking, you know, uh, I flew to New York and I worked with their studio, but um, once everything was finished and I got to have this like nice bundled up class teaching everything I know about print on demand, I watched it, which by the way, watching a recording of yourself is really horrifying the first time it does get easier it gets easier but um yes yeah, so what happened is that class launched i got a lot of really really good feedback it was a free class that was on skillshare um and yeah i think that launched like seven years ago but what happened is a bunch of reviews started pouring in i started getting emails um, from people who let me know how much that had helped them how much my advice and kind of me just blathering on about everything I know about print on demand uh, really helps them get a little bit ahead. And so that became a motivator for me to put together more educational content. So I started a blog where I talked about things about art licensing or techniques I use while I'm painting. Um, I made an FAQ page on my website, but I was still getting emails. I was still getting messages and DMs, like wanting more and more and more information. So then I was like, okay, I enjoy helping others. Uh, as much as filming a class was like, was torture for me being in front of a camera and speaking, uh, that end product and that end results and kind of that, I guess, not just gratification, but um, like sense of purpose I felt and being able to help others in a wider way while still traveling the world and painting and doing everything I love. It just felt like everything was really clicking into place. So now I've got 
oh man, I think I've got 25 or 26 classes now. Um, I'm still traveling the world full time. Um, I have agent an agency now called Jewel Branding and Licensing that represents me. So um, I'm no longer doing the whole A to Z of art licensing. I'm creating the files, but they're now going on, like going out on my behalf and seeking out um, relationships and more collaboration. So yeah, that's kind of freed up my plate to do more of the educational stuff. So this is a really long intro and I'm just going to cut it right now. So. <laughs> it is totally fine. Yeah. That's I mean, I, this is like super informal. So yeah, I mean, and the thing is, I mean, if we go, I don't want to go over, you know, in respect for your time. Um, but you know, my graphic design certainly doesn't mind if we go over an hour, but I, <laughs> I don't want to keep you too long. So, um, thank you so much for all that. It is, I've been following you and, and I've watched a lot of your, uh, obviously your classes, but also I've watched a lot of webinars with you. And, um, yeah, I mean, you really are kind of the poster child of how to transition into having multiple income streams and how, you know, I like, and I appreciate that you said that it was slow growth. One of the things Stacy Bloomfield says, and I just love her. She has so many like nuggets of wisdom is slow growth is good growth. And I know in the beginning for a lot of people, it's really frustrating when you, and I don't want to say imposter syndrome, but when you compare yourself to other people and you compare what Stacy says, you're beginning to someone else's middle. And the thing is, you know, Instagram is such a like shiny, polished place that everyone, you know, kind of forgets that it's not like everybody who starts doing this hits the ground and immediately has, you know, thousands of dollars of print on demand sales in the first month. It just takes time. And it takes patience, but it's it's absolutely doable to become successful on all kinds of different platforms. So, yeah, um, I'm I'm really glad you mentioned that because yeah, so many and I'm guilty of it as well. Um, it, we just kind of share what's going on right now, kind of the highlight reel of what am I doing this year in 2024, and it's it's really cool stuff. But it's some it's stuff that like back you know nine or ten years ago, I started a print on demand shop and. 2014. So yeah, this is my 10 year anniversary of starting to earn that side income that eventually became, you know, one of many diversified income streams. Yeah, it, it, all of it was was a slow grow. I got really lucky with that that first six months on Society6 being incredibly lucrative. But that is pretty much of, of all of my kind of like endeavors in my business income streams, things I like to focus on. That was the that was the fastest and luckiest one. And it just happens to be at the beginning. Um, and a lot of things too, it's, you can't replicate somebody else's success um, in the exact same way that they did it. Like 2014, print on demand, completely different space, a lot less competitive. Um, even the, the margins were a little bit better too. Um, and one thing we saw a lot last year with print on demand um, across the entire industry, Spoonflower, Redbubble, Society6, was passing on more fees to artists and just, you know, those inklings just get shorter and shorter. But yeah, I think kind of going back to what you were saying, slow slow growth is good growth because um, when you can see that growth, it and especially when it's sustainable, even if it's slow, it it really shows that you're onto something and you have the potential to put, like scale. Um, yeah. And that's that's one thing I look for a lot in my business. I spend you know ten, twenty, sometimes even fifty percent of my time in my business. Uh, doing what I call prospecting, which is not doing the thing which I know is going to make me money. Like if I paint a um, a paint like a watercolor of a cheetah right now and I send it to my agents, they're going to be able to get that licensed out almost immediately. Everyone's going crazy for for jungle cats right now, um, but. Uh, I also want to focus on things in my business that um, help me diversify my income streams. So one thing I'm working on is putting together a signature course showing how I put together collections. And I hope that's going to be um, a, a viable income stream for me in the future, but it's something brand new that I've never done in my business before. So you kind of have to balance out what you know is going to work and what's been that proven success and then trying out new things, but not being afraid of failure because most of the new things I try out just don't go anywhere, but that's okay because the things that do work out are what propel my business forward. Yeah. And, you know, I have to say too, like, you know, taking risks is such an important part of having this lifestyle and this career because, you know, you if you just stuck with one thing all the time, I mean, things change. 
And you can't expect, you know, even print on demand, for instance, to be the same next year as it was this year. I mean, with AI and everything that's oh, yeah. that's happening. And I know these companies are really scrambling to adjust to just this changing climate. But, um, you know, it's like when you try something new and if it doesn't do well, I just always try to ask myself in every single situation, like a three-year-old would ask their parent, why? Why did that happen? Is it because I did it too fast? Did I do it wrong in this way? And, you know, everything, even a failure for me, I always look at as a learning experience. And sometimes it's just the learning experiences. I shouldn't have done that, or <laughs> I didn't really want to do that. But regardless, it's still valuable information. And things like yep. print on demand and teaching a class, you put in some time, but generally there's not a lot of overhead as far as, you know, like if you already have your, your filming set up and stuff like that, or you already have the design. I mean, okay, so it didn't work on Society6. Well, the audience on uh, Spoonflower is different. So if you have a standalone piece of art that maybe doesn't do very well on Society6, put it on a wall hanging on, on Spoonflower. You never know, or turn it into a repeat pattern. Um, or rework it. Maybe the colors were wrong. So, you know, it's just, it's not like, I never look at like a failure as like a brick, like drop down, like an end point. It's like a, a road that just needs to change direction. Maybe, um, yeah. you know, yeah, even, it's like, even, even um, like a lot of my failures, like the, the two good things they do for me is one, I had to learn something um, in the process of creating what ended up being a failure. But so there, there's learning there. And like that learn that knowledge doesn't go away, that stays with you. So the next time you're you're trying something, you can you can use some of that same knowledge. And two, like, and this is this is the one that I think is really important. It it helps me um it helps me get used to failure. And yeah. it's no longer a crushing blow every single time I do something that doesn't pan out. And that's really, really important to be successful as an entrepreneur um, in surface design, especially in art licensing. Like in my business, I have more rejections than, than I have wins. And if I didn't have tough skin, which spoiler alert, I did not at the beginning, um, it's, it's, it's crushing, you know, yeah. like every rejection of like, hey, would you like to license this? And, you know, crickets, you don't get any email response. It's like, oh, no, I shouldn't even do this industry. But that that goes away quickly. Like you get you kind of you get thicker skin and you get more and more used to those rejections because it's just in inevitability in our industry. I mean, across entrepreneurship, any anyone mm -hmm. that's kind of striking out on their own and trying something and the sooner you um yeah the sooner you just kind of accept that that's going to be part of your day-to-day -day in your business and your reality it, it becomes less of a big deal like yeah when I get rejections now I'm like oh okay well I'll focus on this other thing that's working well and you know there can be like a tinge of sadness from time to time but it's not no it's no longer at the point where I question why am I doing what I'm doing did I choose the right career path Right. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love that. And, you know, I think too, and I don't know if this is the same for you, but, you know, being an artist, I mean, I pour my heart and soul into everything I do. And I am very sensitive because I'm an artist, but going to graphic design school really taught me <laughs> how to accept criticism really well. Oh, they tear it, you down. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't have to be, uh, you know, somebody with a graphic design degree to understand what that's like, but um, just going through any kind of critique, whether it's your agent saying, Hey, you know, maybe this is not going to work or whatever, but you know, yeah, they, they definitely tear you down. You have to learn, even though when you're creating it and you're in the middle of making, you know, designing something, you're like, Oh God, my heart is like pouring into this. Once you're done and you release it like a, you know, child going off to college, I always let it go a little bit. I'm not super precious about everything because it's like, you know what, maybe I, maybe this was something that I really loved and maybe it's the perfect fit for, you know, someone, but you know, maybe I need to like disconnect myself a little bit from it. So then I don't feel personally crushed when I get a rejection. So it's like, okay, well maybe they didn't like this art piece, but that's not a reflection on me or my talent or my skill or my hard work or anything like that. And yeah. that's been really helpful for me. And a, and a lot of times when uh, within art licensing and surface design, a lot of times when you get rejections, it's simply because the brand that you've reached, I'm in this like kind of like swivel rocking chair. So just ignore this. Um, oh, it's fine. Of, <laughs> I'm in a like, I'm in a swivel chair too. Okay, cool. I'm like, yeah, my, my, I try anyway. not to move too much when I'm talking, but yeah. Be proper. 
Um, but yeah, anyway, so a lot of the times when you get a rejection, when you're reaching out to an art director or a, a brand for licensing, um, it, it's not necessarily the quality the quality of your work or your portfolio in general. Um, a lot of times they they have specific trends they're looking for that they want to pull for the next quarter or, or a, you know, a quarter, a year from now is, is typically what it is. And so, and if what you're sending them doesn't align with their trend tracking sheet that they're very studiously following, they're just going to say no. It doesn't mean that that same artwork might not become applicable, um, you know, for the next, the next year or, or down the road. So um, yeah, a lot of the time, like if I send, if I send some stuff to my agent, like one thing they told me, I was on a call with my agent a few weeks ago and they were like, yeah, you're kind of doing this like cowgirl Western stuff. And it's, it's not like you can probably stop. <laughs> <laughs> it is and definitely, it, that is a big trend right now, it but is, yeah, but time will tell for, us to whether or not that's, I haven't done any because I'm yeah. a little wary of like, how long is this one going to last? You know, it's I, not I, like I, mushrooms, I, exactly. which are apparently going to be trendy until the end of time. <laughs> yeah. Mushrooms have been phenomenal in my portfolio. If I were just to do a whole series of mushrooms, it would, it would do very well. But yeah, but like the cowgirl stuff, it's because that that is trending in certain spaces right now, but it's not trending through the licensees that my agents work with. And so the brands that my agents are working with aren't sending them uh, trend books that, that include that specific category. So with my agents, they're looking at who are they licensed, who are they able to get my artwork licensed to, and what are those people looking for? And if Cowgirl Western isn't really on the docket, then they don't want that stuff right now. Yeah. They want a, a lot of other stuff. Like I mentioned, Jungle Cats, like I've been working on those for a few years, going strong. Mushroom, anything, it gets picked up like that. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's interesting to see. So it's not necessarily, you know, your style or the quality of your work. Maybe it's just your motif or your color palette isn't aligning with what those buyers are looking for for the next season. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing too, is I think like, it just may not be the right fit because that that agency or that company already has enough of that. So there's also something to be said for, you know, jumping on a trend and I'm kind of leaning a little away from trends more than I used to now because I'm start and I've been doing like a lot of cats and cat butts <laughs> because that's really like becoming my thing. I think I'm like making jokes to my friends. I'm like, just call me cat butt Carrie because I have this one design that I did of this cat and uh, he's like licking his butt and it says reach for the stars. And I literally just did that. Like I just saw that on Instagram. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I was looking at my crazy cat. I'm just drawing what I know and what's in front of me every day. And I just did it because it was hilarious. And it is becoming like the thing that people are getting back to me about. And like, it's selling like crazy. I opened an Etsy shop and I'm selling like five, 10, you know, things a day with that on there. And I'm That's like, awesome. what is going on? And it's this one design. But the thing is, is that it's like, it just depends on the audience. Because I will tell you right now that like home decor companies don't want cat butts you know, for like high end, you know, home decor pro pillows. There's a so market it just for depends it. on your market. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and that's, that's a, that's a big one too, because the types of like the type of artwork that I have sold through like the hobby lobbies and Walmarts and, and Michaels, like craft stores of the world is completely different from the type of work that I have sold through anthropology and urban outfitters at Nordstrom. You know, it's, yeah. it's different audiences and those brands are selecting different pieces for my portfolio. So it's, yeah. it's nice to have a range if you can, um, you know, so much of surface design is, is just, um, is quantity, right? Like, um, I've, I've, I've shared these stats before, but it's, it's the 80, 20 rule to a T it's like, 20% of my portfolio earns me 80% of my art licensing income. So mm -hmm. my, my strategy, obviously everything that I put the effort into creating or painting, I want it to be a bestseller, but realistically not everything will be. And so I'm creating things that I'm like, okay, hopefully this is going to, this is going to be a really good one in the portfolio, but really only about 20% are, um, but that's okay because I, you know, I, I enjoy painting. I paint quickly. No, no piece of mine, no design of mine is ever a hundred percent ready to go. By the way, it's, there's always things that I'm like, oh, should I improve this? Could I tweak this a little bit? But everything that I put in my portfolio is good enough, right? Yeah. Because if, if it has to be a hundred percent, then I'm just never going to finish it. And I'd rather, um, get pieces out that are like 90, 95% I'm okay with. Um, mm -hmm. and then, and then get to work on the next one. So yeah. 
that's I know that's a hurdle for a lot of um, a lot of creatives. I mean, really for any any industry too, it's like, oh, my website needs to be 100% perfect before I can launch it. Or, um, you know, I need to get my, my artwork needs to be a little bit better before I can put it on Instagram. And all of those limiting beliefs just um, just delay your, like just delay the success that you might otherwise reach sooner. Yeah, or I have to have this million pieces that are all perfect in my portfolio before I can pitch. Yeah. And it's like, no, you don't. I mean, really, if you pitch with like two or three images, embedded in an email, you know, that can be enough. So, you know, yeah, I think that's, and, and I'm, I, I definitely am leaning a little, I was going to say leaning a a little more away from trends now, not that I'm not going to incorporate them, but I just feel like I, I'm not going to just do what I want to do. I'm aware of what the trends are. And of course, colors are always something I'm keyed into like peach fuzz and things like that. But, um, I just like, there are some trends you never know how long they're going to last. And, you know, it's not like I don't want to put the effort in, but if a trend doesn't really speak to me, like the cowgirl aesthetic, I love it. It's super cute, but it's not anything that speaks to me. I don't, I've never even, I think I've visited the Southwest like once. (laughs) So if that was part of my history, then maybe, but um, I just, I'm, I'm from the, you know, East coast and, you know, then I grew up overseas. So I just, uh, I'm like, I, I can imitate or like I can look at some cowgirl boots and draw some and maybe I will. Um, I mean, if I can incorporate a cat or a cat butt into it, maybe I will. And that's, <laughs> that's, that's becoming you know, my thing now. So I think I think one thing that's really important too with trends is it is so important that you have to infuse your own your own voice, your own unique yes. artistic voice into that piece. Otherwise, you're going to wind up with this portfolio that's just a million different styles and there's nothing that really holds it together as being yours. So, you know, not, not every trend I'm going to jump on. I'm only going to jump on the ones that really resonate with me. Yeah. And another thing I look forward to with, with, with trends is how can I repurpose existing work to meet an upcoming trend? So like um, you mentioned peach fuzz, which is the new Pantone color of the year for 2024. Um, as soon as that gets announced, the first thing I do is I go through my portfolio and I look and I see... Um, what pieces of mine already incorporate peach fuzz? And then I'm going to go on to um, like Society6 Red Bubble Spoon Flower and, and change the keyword tags of those pieces just to include peach fuzz because everyone's going to be searching for peach fuzz. Um, and then what I'll also do for my, uh, for, my lic- or for my agents is I'll go through my portfolio and I'll find pieces that would look really good with that peach fuzz palette. And then it's, it's colors that kind of work with it. And I'll make some color alts for a few select pieces, especially some of the best sellers in my portfolio, give it a peach fuzz palette, and then hand it off to my licensors ASAP, or I'm sorry, my agents ASAP, um, so that we can kind of get the ball rolling. And I've jumped on this trend without having to recreate a bunch of artwork. You know, all of my art files are these layered Photoshop files, and it's really easy to just get in there, make a few color tweaks, and then leave. And you know, with that repurposing idea, even with the, um, like that cowboy, like the cowgirl Western aesthetic that my agents told me to stop doing. Um, so the way that that kind of arose is because I did, uh, like, you know, disco retro stuff has been pretty surging the last few years and we're still seeing it this year, which is awesome because so much of my portfolio lately is like retro revival. But anyway, so I did these, um, like, uh, like roller, like roller skate, kind of like platform roller skates for this like whole like roller girl kind of thing. And then I decided to make disco platforms to kind of match those. And then I had two things of shoes and I'm like, let's do some super cool cowgirl boots with some daisies on them. Daisies are trending. And so I could have like this triptych of three types of, of like kind of like vintage shoe wear. And then the Western trend started and I was like, I've already got these cowgirl boots that I created for this other thing. Let's just slap a howdy on there and I'm ready to go. Like there, I've leveraged the uh, the Western trend. So yeah, there's there's ways that you can kind of lean into to trend tracking and, and having your artwork feel more, more on trend with what's happening right now um, without having to reinvent the wheel. And repurposing your artwork um, when it makes sense is a really, uh, really smart way to do that. Yeah. And it probably doesn't hurt that you're psychic because you (laughs) keyed into the llama thing, I think, before llamas got trendy. That was, which is amazing. So you might have some kind of extra 
special powers there too. But yeah, a, a lot of my portfolio is based off of my travels around the world. And I had just happened to be in Peru. I was doing the four day um, Inca trail trek to Machu Picchu uh, with my parents. It was an awesome family trip. But yeah, and of course, you see llamas and alpacas just everywhere um, down there. And I was taking pictures of all of them. And when I got back from that trip, I think that was in 2015. When I got back, I did a whole um, watercolor of alpacas, llamas, what have you. And that was right before the alpaca llama trend just skyrocketed. So I got in there early. I put it out there early. And that one was 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 luck. You know, it's like I didn't paint those because I thought they were going to be this huge trend. I painted them as a kind of souvenir and reflection of this time that I spent down in Peru. So you know what? Luck is also a pretty important factor. So when it comes yeah. to what do you need to succeed in surface design, um, you, you need you need talent, ambition, grit, um, perseverance, but then also a little bit of luck comes into play as well. Like right time, right place. Um, you can't it, it's not all of it, but it's a little bit of it. Yeah. And I have to say, I don't know if you've ever read the book, Big Magic. Um, I, mm -hmm. along with Jenna Blackburn, she's the one who actually told me about it, but I re I think I realized I had read it years before. I'm just but, writing it um, down right now. Big oh, magic. it's such a great book. It's, it's basically the, the overall Thank message you. that I kind of take away is if you have an idea of something you want to create, don't wait D because someone else is going to create it it's just a matter of time and don't sit there and go, well, it's not perfect or I don't know or whatever. And the thing is you just release those llamas. You're like, I'm going to put these out here, these llamas and alpacas. And I'm really glad you did because, you know, if you had waited, it might've just turned into, well, now I'm just jumping on the already existing trend versus you did something that you wanted to create. You were lucky, you know, maybe that doesn't always hit. Um, but it's like, don't hesitate. If you have something that is burning to get out of you, make it and put it out there. And, you know, worst case scenario, it doesn't land. Big deal. Move on to the next thing. It's okay. Um, and you know what? Don't delete it. You never know. Five years from now or a year from now, that might be trending. You know, maybe you're yeah. way ahead of your time. Or it might come back around. That's the other cool thing about trends is they're cyclical. So, you know, a lot of things that were trendy, you know, 20 years ago, uh, I mean, I look at stuff from like when I was a freshman in college in the early 90s, and I'm like, oh my God, like, why is that there? Like, why are people doing that again? <laughs> and I'm finally at the age where I'm like rolling my eyes at what the kids are doing. So, but I'm like, obviously that's also stuff that makes me go, oh, well, maybe I should pay attention to that because I actually was there for that. So yeah. You know, and and I that remember. and that bodes that bodes well for storytelling too. When you talk about the inspiration behind that design you created, you know we're seeing all this like Y two K stuff come back into style. Um, yeah, like a lot of a lot of my portfolio, like I said, is based off of my travels around the world. And one thing that uh, my licensees really like is that, like when I did a new um, bedding collection with Target last year, I was able to be like, oh, here's these fan palms that I painted that are now duvet covers. But here's a special story about this hiking trip I took in Vietnam, took pictures of these wild fan palms, came back to my apartment in Thailand, watercolored them. Um, and that was six years ago. And now they're getting picked up for a licensing deal. So, um, yeah, I think a lot of brands that I work with, they like that when they license with me, they get a good storytelling piece. And um, it's not it's not like you have to be like it's not like you have to travel the world just to get a good storytelling piece. in. you can do um, like like you mentioned, you're doing you're doing your cats, right? Um, you can talk about how that's your own cat and maybe a funny anecdote about, you know, whatever your cat was doing, inspire the piece. Um, and I, I think people like to see that. And, and that's kind of what separates, um, you know, traditionally surface design, like how many times have you looked at your throw pillow and thought like, Hmm, I wonder who made that? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess in our industry, everybody thinks that, but outside of it, many people don't think about who created the the piece, especially for utilitarian products on surface design. And um, the more that we can kind of infuse our own unique artistic voice, the the more um, marketable, I guess, our, our own designs are because brands are wanting to show more and more now, like this isn't, especially right now with AI, you know, this isn't yep. just a mass generated AI piece of art. This is a, like a hand painted or hand drawn and procreate or hand designed and illustrator, whatever have you, um, piece that a designer made that has a, a story behind it that just makes it feel a little bit more human um, and marketable. So those things definitely come into play as well. 
Yeah. And I, I have to interject that. Um, and I have a couple of questions I'm going to go through with you really quickly that we, I want to at least run through the ones that my community asked, but um, I, I predict that uh, I know AI is crazy and a little intimidating and it's kind of, you know, everyone's trying to figure it out and I still don't know how I feel about it, but um, I'm starting to think that it's going to actually in a way benefit us as human beings who have a story behind our art, because I think a lot of companies where they were licensing uh, uh, nameless art from a nameless person and it was like a factory and like, here, give me this pattern. Okay, next. Now, you know, you're going to start seeing more and more, here's the designer and the person behind this art that we're selling. And here's why we are not selling you a duvet cover with a mass generated thing that was created by a machine. So it might actually benefit us more to be the people behind it. We might even get more exposure uh, versus, you know, we no com machine can compete with us and our stories and our face. So you I know, mean, and I, I yeah, see that becoming a thing. It's it's huge. And I mean, I've gotten licensing deals specifically because brands wanted to work with me because they knew that I have um, I have an engaged audience. I put myself out there. You see my face. You see me talking on my on my Instagram page. And, you know, that that was that was that's a whole nother like nerve wracking thing to get into of like, oh, God, to be the face of my brand. What does this mean? Like a lot of artists, we like to hide behind our artwork. But it, it it can really benefit you to put yourself out there and show your personality um, in, ta in tandem with with your artwork. Um, even like, I mean, the, the last call I had with my with my agency, they mentioned this as well. They were like, "Hey, um, next time you're in the states, go into Target, um, especially in the kind of home decor and stationery aisle, and you'll see these. Um, oh, they're called like end of aisle." stamps end caps stamps, like mark, end caps there it is i was like i used to work in branding i used to have this vocab <laughs> these end caps and what they're doing is they're featuring artists so um it's exactly what you said it's like a picture of the artist um maybe a brief bio what inspired it and then an entire collection of pieces that they created and it's it's like the data is there those when um when pieces get displayed like that where you get to see the artists sales skyrocket and so um, I think, yeah, you're exactly right. We're going to start seeing more and more of that. I mean, one thing that um, some of my licensors are asking me for now is not just, you know, signing a contract and then they take my art and do whatever they want with it, which is kind of the old school way of doing art licensing. Now we're including other things into the agreement. Like they want me to make a reel showing like maybe like unboxing the product and like showing what this final stationary set looks like and maybe holding up my original watercolor that then it turned into. Um, or, or walking into the store itself, you know, which is always like a little bit awkward and, uh, on video and on Instagram reel, and then like showing like how, uh, like showing my display. So I did like these lunch boxes with, um, Sam's club a couple of years ago. And part of our contract was I'll do like a store walkthrough where I'll walk into the store, see my product, like hold it up. And it was really cool. It was a cool experience. Um, it got a ton of engagement and as cringy as it is to like be films, you know, with an iPhone by my boyfriend in a Sam's club, like that's, it's cringy. And the, still the final piece was really fun. So yeah, I saw yeah. it. I thought it was great. Thank yeah. you. I'm like <laughs> holding yeah. up these lunchbox. But yeah, no, yeah, I thought it, it I thought good. it was really great. And it was very, it, it didn't seem, you seemed very comfortable in front of the camera. I, I was watching it was a lot the of other day. Yeah. Like you were talking with, I think it was Audra last week and you yeah. said you were an introvert which I guess you are um but it's because you present yourself so well and you're so comfortable and like I guess just laid back you don't seem like an introvert in in a good way because you seem like you're like I really want to get this out there and I really want to talk to you yeah. and show my face and everything so um, you know, I, I like, I, I'm like, I'm an introverted extrovert. Like I, I get my energy from reading books on the couch and painting and having solo time, but I still love getting out there. And, you know, every once in a while I get to teach a live art class, you know, it happens once in a blue moon it hasn't happened since COVID, but um, yeah, like those kinds of things. Like I do like having kind of times throughout the year where I get to teach live to students because so much of what I teach is to a camera. And then the only interaction I have is maybe in the discussion forum them or through DMs or emails, things like that. So yeah. being out there live from time to time is really fulfilling. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So I'm going to just really quickly, I know I had some questions for you and these are absolutely not questions we have to answer. You have to answer all of them. 
but I did want to make sure that I touched on a couple of things. Um, so I did, I actually had asked you, um, if you saw any design trends you were particularly excited about, and I think we, we covered two of these. Um, we talked about peach fuzz, the color of the year. Um, and I also have to add that, you know, I've noticed that you have used a peach color in a lot of your art, like even since I think the first or second class of yours that I took years ago. So, um, you know, that's just a universally, I guess, timeless color, which is great. Um, they picked that then, color and I was like, yes. I, yeah. I hate when they, I hate yeah. When they it's a one great. I'm like, yeah. It's, it's not it's, gray. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. I hate when they pick one where I have nothing in my portfolio of that color and I just don't like using it. Then I'm like, oh, man. But this one was a home run for for me personally. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then you said uh, artist series. So is that are, is that what we're talking about when you say artist series, like where it's like a featured artist and, and you are the kind of well, tell me, tell me what you mean by artist series. Yeah, that's kind of what I was talking about with those end caps that you see at Target where it's featuring the artists um, and then other iterations of that as well, which um, I don't know if you want to get into contracts, but um, when I'm doing a contract with a, um, with a licensee, I, I'm not just talking about the royalty rate in terms of what I'm getting out of the contract. I mean, um, there's other things I can ask for. And some, and sometimes I'll ask for like an artist's uh, like Q and a that's featured on their website. And yeah, it's going to take me a couple hours out of my day to answer their questions and put together, you know, the assets for that, but it's great promotion and feature for me. They love it because it's free content for their website. Um, so anything, um, and, and the other thing that I offer to do with my licensees now is, um, I'm like, Hey, I have, I don't have a huge following on social media. Like I'm not an influencer with millions of followers, but I've got, you know, I don't, I'm not going to leave my, I think it's like 70 or 75,000 right now. You have a lot. <laughs> yeah. And, and so it's, it's a good chunk. And so my licensees like to see that because, um, I can tell them, Hey, I'll also be featuring, um, whatever the product is that we're in contract under. I can mention like, hey, I'll also be featuring this on my Instagram. I'll be promoting it. I can link back to your website. Um, so anything on anything I can do on my end to really promote, um, like here's the artist behind the piece, it, it's a win-win for me and my licensor. Uh, some brands care about it more than others, like especially like smaller boutique brands. But now, now seeing Target get into it, I mean, mm -hmm. when they when they do something, it, it, it affects the entire industry. And so yeah, I, I feel a lot of appreciation that they're leaning more into that as well of like, let's feature the artist behind the piece. And it it benefits us all so much. It benefits our industry, especially in this world of AI, which I think is going to be your third question. Yeah. So that's what I was going to ask you about. Yeah. AI is such a hot topic. And you, so when I said, what um, what trends are you excited about? Um, you had said utilizing AI ethically. ethically. I don't know why I can't say that word. So what do you mean by that? So, okay. Um, I, I mean, everyone in the space has kind of seen what's happening with AI right now. Um, just in one sentence, you can you can generate a text prompt of like, show me um, palm trees in Palm Springs with a Palm Springs style house, and then it can generate a piece of artwork. And um, you didn't create that artwork. All you did was kind of put it in the written prompt. And the the kind of unknown right now is, can you then take what AI generated and monetize it and profit from it? And that's kind of what, what the gray zone is right now. I think this year, 2024, we're going to see, we're going to see a lot more of these cases um, actually go to court and have decisions be made, which set precedents. So we'll have hopefully a little bit more clarity, but in the meantime, um, it's still like, I, I think there's, I know there's ways that you can still use AI ethically in your, um, in your artwork. Um, and so one, I guess a few ways that I use it, um, I started using AI, I downloaded or, or signed up for an account with chat GBT um, about a year ago, because everybody was using it, I wanted to see what it was all about. And it was fun, you know, I can kind of use it like Google. But then um, I started using it to polish up my writing. So maybe an Instagram post, like my writing style is a little bit dry. Um, it's very like analytical, like I used watercolor number blah, blah, blah to paint this. Like it's, 
Um, I can be fluid with it, but it takes a little bit more work. So one thing I started using was ChatGPT, where I could kind of plug in a bunch of bullet points of ideas that I wanted to cover. And I would have ChatGPT turn it into like three paragraphs. And then it's just a way that I use to kind of collect my thoughts and then have it, um, that second part of the process done for me. Um, and then getting into the artist side of it, one way that I've been using AI, I have ChatGPT4 now, which does image generation. So similar to MidJourney and some of the other AIs that create images. Um, and so when I'm creating something from scratch, usually what I do is let's just say, let's go back to like cheetahs, right? Because um, I, I just did this African safari a couple months ago. And my next collection is all of the animals I took photographs in Africa. I'm doing a whole like little safari animal collection. But um, yeah, so for cheetahs, so I have all of these reference photos of cheetahs. And what I want to do is I want to see all of these different compositions of what they could look like. And traditionally, what I would do is I would draw out cheetahs in all these different positions, scan it into my computer, and then collage them in Photoshop and just see like what different compositions could look like. And then I started doing it in Procreate. It's way faster. But um, yeah, so now what I can do is I can get on like chat GPT-4 and I'll be like, show me 20 different compo compositions of like maybe a pattern of cheetahs and antelopes with rainbows and um, like savanna safari trees. And what um, what the you know chat GPT will do is then generate 20 different compositions. So rather than me doing all of that by hand and scanning in it and looking and seeing what compositions are working and what aren't working, I can just get a very general view right off the bat of like, oh, I like the way that the uh, maybe like the juxtaposition of size between these little flowers and these big cheetahs. That's something I'm liking that I'm seeing in these compositions that chat GPT is just, you know, splayed out for me. Um, I can see like, oh, I think this pose looks nice, like next to this pose. And then what I can do is take this whole idea of all these different compositions, and then kind of Frankenstein together things that I like and things that I don't like. So it still ends up being a, um, a, a, a completely original and custom composition that then I can take and, um, you know, paint by hand or maybe draw and procreate. So the final output of the art will still be my own. It'll still either be hand painted or hand drawn. Um, but I can use AI to kind of speed up that process of either brainstorming in the first place. Like I've used, I've used chat GPT to be like, what are the, give me 20 really hot trends in surface design right now, specifically of motifs that are selling in like anthropology or target. And just to, and, and rather than like going to the website and scrolling through the new section and being like, I see a lot of zebra, maybe I should do some zebras. Um, I can kind of use AI to kind of jumpstart that process a little bit. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the way that I've been using it. So mostly writing, polishing up my writing, um, or taking existing pieces of writing, like my class description for one of my most popular Procreate classes. Um, my class is called Blooms and Shrooms, Draw Fun and Funky Art and Procreate. And it's a fun class, it's a fun title. But then my class description that I wrote was like so dry. It's like, we will be using the Apple Pencil. To da -da -da. <laughs> and I was like, this is so boring. And so I plugged it into ChatGBT and I was like, I was like, insert some mushroom and flower puns into this paragraph to make it more fun. And then like, you know, it did like 30 puns and most of them were just awful, but I got like two good ones out of there. Right. Yeah. And so I just used it as a way to kind of make my writing style a little bit more friendly, add some puns in there. So basically what I'm saying with AI is it's not going to do everything for you, but you can use it to um, strategize your process like I do uh, with ChatGPT or to even speed up that um, the idea gen or the compositions. But I still like everyone treats AI differently and everyone kind of has their own set of, of morals with it. Like how far will they take it? Um, but for me personally, that's, that's where I feel comfortable. Um, and then everything that I create, I still want it to be done by my own hand. And yeah, I think it's pretty exciting to see where, where we're going with AI. I it's, it's terrifying at the same time, like any new change for an industry is inherently scary, but I also think there's going to be a lot of opportunities there for us as well. So yeah. I don't know. What are your thoughts on AI? I'm curious. Well, you know, the thing that I keep thinking about, I mean, obviously AI is, you know, it, it's affecting us. It's definitely affecting us because I feel like a lot of the changes, which we can get into this next um, really quickly is the print on demand changes. But the a lot of the print on demand companies are enacting these changes 
as a reaction to the flood of art that's coming from non-artists who are creating art using AI. And they're like, whoa, this is, we already were, had a lot of people on our platform and it was competitive. Now, you know, Spoonflower just uh, made 25 limit, uh, 25 a week is your max. Um, and they I, cut their design challenges in half. It, it's not, they it's did, no yeah. every week. Every, every other week, week. yeah. Yep. Um, but the thing is, is, um, I remember, and this is going to date me when Photoshop came out with filters. So that's, <laughs> that's a while, it was a while ago. Uh, I remember using Photoshop like 2.0 or whatever. And, um, when Photoshop first came out with a lot of their more advanced filters, not their basic ones, like blur and stuff like that, but like, you know, their cutout and a lot of these other ones. First of all, everybody was going crazy using them and overusing them. And you could tell, and it was ridiculous. And mine was lens flare. Ooh. Lens flare is fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. And it's, I think it's still in there too. Yeah. Um, but when that came out, a lot of people, and I also was a little nervous. And, um, you know, it's anytime a new technology is introduced that does a lot of the, I guess, visual work for you, people don't get as bristled about you know, things like text, I guess, because, you know, it's harder to, you can't just read something or listen to something and go, I know who wrote that versus I know who painted that or drew that. Um, but I think a lot of it is we need to remember that it is a tool, just like Photoshop filters are a tool. And you can either, you know, put, if you put a, a paint or a photograph into Photoshop and you hit filter, blah, 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 one, two, done. And then you're like, I'm done. Did you really create that art? I don't know. I mean, not really. Photoshop did it for you with a filter. So, you know, yes, you made some decisions. And if you make more and more changes, obviously that becomes more and more you. Okay, I'm going to adjust the color. And now I'm going to, you know, paint over this or whatever. But the thing is, is like it, AI is, I think it's a tool, but it's just part of a process. So it's like, you have the idea, I want to make something like this. And then you put the information into AI and then it generates something like this, but then you have to go past that and, you know, create beyond what they, you don't just spit out whatever they give you. I mean, you can, and a lot of people do, but that's kind of my rule. Um, and I really haven't played a whole lot with AI, um, mostly just because I haven't had time, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I want to, and I like the idea of using it as, and I've talked to other artists too, who kind of use it as like, you know, when you're sitting there and you're trying to think of really the, the hard part of coming up with a design, isn't just, I want to draw a cheetah. It's, I want a composition. Should the cheetah be here and the palm tree should be there. And then there should be a person over here. Or should I do a really close up of the half the cheetah's face, like looking this direction and, you know, he's looking at something in the distance or whatever. So I think if you look at it more as that kind of a tool to like, push you forward, or maybe push you in a direction that you wouldn't naturally go, maybe you wouldn't have thought of that composition, then I think it's awesome. Um, but the problem is that it is, you know, the wild west not to be, you know, I'm bringing back the cowgirl theme again. somehow. <laughs> <laughs> but it is like the wild west, I guess, because um, people, you know, just like when Canva came out, just like Photoshop, a lot of technology out there, people who are not, you know, who are not artists, and I'm not saying I'm an artist, and all these other people aren't, I'm saying people who are literally just, I'm going to, you know, create things to sell. I'm going to get on the computer. I want to be lazy and hit a bunch of keys and then put it out there and sell it. Um, versus somebody who's like, Hey, I want to create something. I want to use this as a tool. I think people who, people who are not artists or who really have no intention of creating things that are, you know, art creating things artistically are, are able to create things that are, you know, mimicking what somebody with years of training may be spent creating. And that's kind of the scary part because it is getting smarter and, you know, stuff like that. But, you know, and there have been Photoshop filters and um, like I used to use another, you know, uh, app that I don't even know if it's around anymore, but it would make oil paintings and they looked really realistic out of a photograph, like surprisingly realistic. And I'm like, I can't paint an oil, but, but I was like, you know what? I'm not going to use these for anything. I played around with it and I'm like, that's not me and whatever. But, um, it's just, a lot of it is regulation and, um, putting some guidelines around 
what constitutes art, which we're still trying to define in so many other arenas too, with copyright and, you know, just everything. So, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the, 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 the reason why ethics, morality come into it is because where are those images coming from? When, when I say I want to have 10 cheetah compositions, those are getting pulled from existing um, usually other artists artwork and right. so or photographers in, or whatever or photographers yeah. everything and any visual image that's on the internet and so when those AI um, image generators um, started being more and more um, mainstream last year in 2023 um, you were literally seeing artist signatures somewhere on the piece because the um, the pool of references that, that they were pulling from were so small uh, now, I mean, AI has been advancing so rapidly. It's like month by month, there's there's major changes. Remember, like those early ones where like fingers would always be messed up, you know? And yeah, like, or like oh, six fingers or something. Six yeah. fingers, and you're like, that's an AI piece. Um, like that's that's been solved. Um, the signature thing that got solved, I feel like in like a week or something. So it's like the the advances in this are so fast, and also the pool of um, like reference images that AI pulls from now. It's it's now in the hundreds of thousands. It's in the millions, and so it's becoming harder and harder to see like, oh, this AI generated piece is from this artist. You do still see that occasionally, but it's becoming more and more rare. Yeah. And so, just as it as that pool of references dilutes further and further, it's going to be harder to say for, for artists to have a claim to say this AI piece was stolen from my artwork. It's just going to become more and more challenging. Yeah. But yeah, that's that's something that. You mentioned these uh, print on demand websites have been dealing with as well. Like there's no, it's not a coincidence that everybody, all these print on demand started having design limit restrictions around the same time that people were mass generating AI artwork. And, um, you know, on the back end, Society6, Printful, Redbubble, they all, they, they all have to store those files on their servers. And so server fees just exponentially increase as more and more artwork gets uploaded to the site. Plus, the site gets really diluted with a lot of um, like AI artwork and low quality artwork. Spam artwork um, is is a big thing. Like I have, I, I see my stuffs being sold on other people's like Redbubble Society six shops all the time, all the time. <laughs> I report it, it gets removed, but it it just that will never stop. And so, and, and then it pops up again or a different piece. <sighs> it's happened to me too. Yeah, I know. Oh, and I'm like, so I can't annoying. sit here and police this. I know I've got other things to do. But um, yeah, so now we're seeing all these changes across the print on demand space. And, you know, like I mentioned earlier, anytime there's a change, it, it comes with fear and worry and anger and uncertainty, like all of these things. And so across print on demand, we saw a lot of changes last year. We saw uh, Redbubble and Society6 around the same time they announced that artists would now be liable for a percentage of the shipping fees. And so that has never been the case before. It doesn't mean that you have to pay anything um, more to them. It's only when you make a sale and it gets shipped out, a, a, more of a percentage of that shipping fee gets passed on to the artist. And a, it, it upset a lot of people. Like I, I wasn't thrilled when I saw that, you know, it was yeah. like, oh man, that's, that's just going to eat into my profits. It's, it's a bummer. And then, um, and then more and more changes came out. First, Redbubble introduced their um, their different tiers. Tiers. By the yeah. way, I see I see we're at the hour. I could go for another fifteen or twenty if you want to. Absolutely, yeah. No, okay, that's totally cool. Because I know we had a couple more questions, and yeah, please yeah. feel free. Yeah, I, I put my. I like, can talk to you all day. On, it's fine. So <laughs> I, I got dressed up for this. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, so we're seeing these these changes in in, um, in print on demand. Now we're having like different tiers of like, do you fall into the um, like the lowest tier where you don't get that much exposure or you get um, you don't get as much royalties with sales. Um, Society Six was the first one in October of 2023 to announce paid tiers where you have to. There's a uh, there's the basic one is free, so you can still have a, a free shop on Society Six, but with an insanely restrictive upload limit. I think it's ten designs unless they've changed it in the past month or so. But and you means, cannot name your own prices either. I think you just yeah. by default get their 10%, which is which, still good, but yeah, honestly, you can't print change on demand, your percentages. Yeah, I, I'm honestly 10% across the board for print on demand is 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 pretty normal. It's better yeah. than any licensing contract. I'll never get 10% on a licensing <laughs> contract. It's always way lower. But anyway, like, yeah. And then like with Society6, then they have like a mid-range tier, which I think is six bucks a month. And then the premium tier, which is 13 and so they give you, you know, different things per per tier, but then it, it becomes a hard decision. It's like, okay, 
for the last 10 years that I've been involved in print on demand society six, I, I haven't had to pay anything. Like it's just, I, I just get money from them. Like it's, right. it's been, that's, that's how it works. And so now we're seeing like, I, I opted in for the, um, the $13 a month, the highest tier with society six, because my, my earnings monthly from society six justify it. It's, you know, it's an investment into future earnings with them. And I'm not losing money. Like the profits I'm making are higher than the $13 a month I'm spending. Um, but I'm, I'm still waiting to see, like, is this going to be worth it long term? Like, they give us an analytics dashboard, we're able to set our own royalty rates. Um, I play around with my royalties on Society6 and Redbubble all the time. Sometimes I bring them down to 10% to see if my sales increase. Sometimes I bump wall art up to like 30 or 40% because that's the one where people are the most okay with spending money. Like you're going to spend no more than $30 on a phone case generally. Like no one would spend, I don't know, a hundred bucks on a phone case, especially when it's sold against other phone cases that are sold for $30. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's the way that the platform is on society six. You see all those products together, but, um, but wall art, I think is the one that you can kind of wiggle around with the most and put higher rates on because people expect to pay more for a print or a framed piece. But, um, yeah, anyway, going off on a tangent again, but this just goes to show, you know, there's a lot of changes and I think we're going to be seeing a lot more across the board with print on demand. And I mean, maybe it'll be a good thing. Maybe it will, you know, kind of like weed out all of those spam accounts that steal our artwork and sell it. Maybe it'll weed out more AI generated stuff or low quality pieces that dilute the the marketplace in general and keep keep our our pieces from standing out. Like, well, I'm 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 cautiously optimistic to see like okay are these changes going to benefit me and other artists that really put in the time and effort in the long run or is it just going to you know or or is that not going to happen so we'll see I I I'm, I'm really waiting for that 6 month mark of uh, having opted in to the the $13 a month plan so I opted in in November so in a few months maybe check in and I'll I'll let you know how it's going but yeah. um, but yeah, that's that's kind of where I see print on demand going. I think we're going to start seeing more restrictions and more changes in the in the years to come as well. Um, and I think like one thing with being a business owner is you just you need to adapt and pivot, sometimes roll with the punches and kind of stay ahead of it and, and not get left behind on things. Yeah. So being adaptable and maybe like maybe you change the way that you've been using print on demand in your business, like way back when 10 years ago i was spending 90% of my time on on print on demand stuff now i spend like i don't know probably 10% or less of my time on print on demand because it's no longer representing that huge chunk of my income like it used to so you know the way that i've treated print on demand has changed with my business um one of the main reasons i still use it to the to the degree i do is because i'm still creating a ton of artwork for um, for licensing. And so uh, if that artwork is created in the first place, why not just toss it up on print on demand, see what happens, see if it's going to earn me anything, because I'm already doing the hard work of putting it together, scanning it in, digitizing it, sending it off to my agents for for licensing deals, just tossing it up on print on demand. In addition to that, isn't that much more work comparatively. Yeah. And I try to sign, uh, if I can, a non-exclusive deals when I do. Yeah. So yeah. I don't have to worry about combing through then and taking things off of a lot of these sites. Cause if you do sign an exclusive deal, you know, and you've got it up on four or five different print on demand, then I have to go, all right, where do I have it? Um, and actually I kind of started using your color coded system on my Mac to oh, yeah. with like, I have like purple is, or red is red bubble. Obviously that makes mm -hmm. sense. And then I have different colors for stuff. Although I, it's hard to remember to use it. Um, yeah. but one of the things that's great about non-exclusive licensing deals is I can just put it out there. I don't have to worry about, you know, okay, I also have it on, so I can earn money on one piece of art in multiple locations and it doesn't hurt me. Um, and most of my licensees, like they, they don't care uh, that I sign exclusive deals with, uh, they don't really care about print on demand and always yeah. ask, don't just assume, but I always ask, I'm like, Hey, just because this is exclusive on coffee mugs in North America, I have it on some print on demand websites. Do you care? And and yeah. ninety nine percent of the time, they're like, no, it's it's cool. We don't care because they don't see print on demand as a competitor. Like yeah. you know, if I have an exclusive with Target, which spoiler, everything with Target, they always require exclusive. Um, 
they they are they they're not i mean always ask don't don't take this verbatim yeah. you always need to check with them but they they don't see redbubble as a competitor to them yeah. so just because i have exclusive coffee mugs with them they're not really going to care if it's on redbubble when i check and ask they're just like yeah it's cool but yeah always yeah. always check yeah and i'm a big fan of put your stuff up on print on demand because you got discovered on society 6 i recently at the end of last year and this was such a weird one um, somebody found one of my, uh, a company found one of my patterns on Spoonflower and um, asked to license my pattern. Ooh. And I don't have an agent. Yeah. And and that's a rare one where they just come to you. That, that's, um, that was my first big break too, is yeah. Outfitters noticed me on Society6 and that was my first foray into licensing. It's because my stuff was out there first too. I, a yeah. lot of people get noticed that way. Yeah. So I'm, I'm always telling people, you know, and everyone's like spoon flour is so saturated. And I'm like, I am one of how many people on there and I don't have 10,000 designs on spoon flour. I think I have like 2000 or something. Cause I've been on there for years, mm -hmm. but um, somebody found me in a sea of all these other people and asked to license my art. And it was actually one of the easiest licensing deals. I did it myself. Um, I didn't even need my attorney because I guess I have too much experience with all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, I did have him take a look at it, but um, you know, it was pretty straightforward and it was like, okay, here's the file, here's your money. Here's the file done. The whole thing was done within five days, five business days. That's I couldn't awesome. believe it. Yeah. And my, you know, it was like, and then they're going to send me free, like, you know, examples of, and they didn't require me to do like a, a reel or anything like that, but you know, I'm going to be like, look at this. This is so exciting. Yeah. So yeah, that's, yeah. That's something to always ask for. I, I always ask for this in contracts is samples of my work. Yeah. And I always phrase it like, so that I can make cool content for social media. Me and, too. And yeah. It, and, you know? and help make you help you make yeah. sales. Yeah. It's not like I need a new phone case. So I need a sample, please. It's like, right. no, I'm, I'm doing this for you as well. And, uh, yeah, yeah. And that's that's one of the reasons why it's so important to have your contact information, email at the bare minimum. But if you also have a website, include that, links to social, but definitely your email and your full name um, in your in your bio on Society6 or Instagram or Behance or whatever you're using. So that if a buyer does come across your work and they want to strike up a licensing deal with you, they can very easily contact you. It's not like they have to make a million clicks just to find out who you are. Right. So just remove as many barriers as possible for them to even get in touch with you in the first place. Yep. Agreed. Always. Um, okay. So I just want to make sure I know you, I know you're probably running short on time. Um, and I know we were talking about, and I'm actually, thank you so much, by the way, I submitted some questions to you. I'm also going to paste your answers into our, um, the, the description of our, this video when I post it. So, um, I'm not too worried about losing anything too much, but, um, I know you had answered a lot of these questions. So one of the things, um, that had come up, we had talked about, um, oh, things that have run their course. Um, but we kind of talked about that and things coming back around. We talked about that as well. Um, oh yeah. Hand lettering cutesy. So you talked about, um, hand lettering cutesy quotes with floral embellishments and wreaths used to be your bread and butter back in 2014, 2014, 15, and it earned you income for years, even after the trend died down. So, yeah. okay. Really so, um, life cycle of trends. Okay. So. Basically, okay, so the, the quotes I was doing, it was actually commissioned by my cousin's wife. She was having a baby and she wanted to have a, like one of my, one of my paintings in the nursery. And she picked out the quote. It was a Shakespeare quote that said, though she be but little, she is fierce. And um, yeah, my cousin's sister liked my watercolor and acrylic work. So she just asked if I could do that in the same style that I'd been doing with these like very delicate cursive hand lettering um, quotes surrounded by like floral wreaths or flowers coming out. And this was like a very like early 2010 aesthetic, like you, you saw it everywhere. And um, yeah, and that, that piece that I did, though she be but little, she is fierce with the kind of the hand lettering and the flowers that became um, my, my best seller for several years, even after that trend died down. So, you know, when, when trends are at their, their peak, you're seeing it. I mean, truly when a trend is at its peak, it's, it's on the runway, it's, it's being debuted. And then you start seeing it as like, what, what kind of stuff is, what's like Nordstrom or Target or, or Macy's like Barnes and Noble, like what are, what are these big pivotal 
um, impactful brands. What are, what are they showcasing? What are they doing? And that's when, at that point in the trend cycle, that's when I'm going to earn the most money because that's when it's being seen by the masses. It, it has the most exposure. But even after, you know, Target stopped selling that kind of like early 20. 2010 um, aesthetic of like cutesy hand lettering. You know what I'm talking about? Like the live, laugh, love kind of stuff. Absolutely, like that was, yeah. That was so popular. Um, yeah, early, early 2000s, 2010s. Um, but yeah, so even after that kind of dies down and becomes like more of a cliche and something that people kind of mock and make fun of, it's still being sold in stores um, that are maybe like a level down from Target. So mm-hmm. something like Hobby Lobby, Michael's, Walmart. Max, yeah. TJ Max, oh my gosh, yeah. I... I I earn a lot of royalties uh, through TJ Maxx of stuff that Target doesn't want to select anymore because it's past trend. But TJ Maxx is like, hey, we're, we're still all about it. Mm-hmm. And so just because a trend might be on its way out or, or, or even better at its peak, you can still jump on that and utilize it if it's something that you know resonates with, with you, the way you create your art, going back to your own unique artistic voice, all of that. So, so yeah, it's, it's, um, and then, yeah, like you mentioned earlier, trends are cyclical. Maybe maybe we'll see that come back. And I've got a ton of art in my portfolio that really um, hammers in like early days of my portfolio, that that very, you know, cutesy floral wreath aesthetic. I've since moved on from it because it's no longer um, something that I, I can monetize that easily. But who knows, maybe in another 5, 10, 20 years, like that art's not going anywhere. It's digitized. It's up on the cloud. It lives. I mean, that's one of the cool things with art licensing is you can paint or draw or create something a decade or two or five ago, and it can still get picked up for a licensing deal. Um, like some, one of my big licensing deals I had this year, it was these, I, I'm like looking around, I always wish I have examples, but it was these like notebooks and planners with these kind of like prickly pear cactuses that I had watercolored from 2019. And it just got picked up at the end of this year debuts uh, this, this, yeah, this year, 2024. And it's artwork that I created six years ago. So mm-hmm. um, it's it's awesome. That's that's one of the really nice things about surface design and art licensing is just the larger you make your portfolio, even if your own artistic voice changes over time, which mine certainly has, like you can still utilize those those earlier pieces. So it's not like, oh, I painted this and it didn't get selected this month or this year. It's not necessarily a failure. It could get picked up later. Yeah. And I like to kind of approach it where I have my website, which has a select few pieces that are my newer favorite ones. But then if an art licensor wants to see my full catalog, my full catalog is huge. So I'm like, you know, you're going to see stuff that's totally not what you would describe as my style in here, but it's there because I created it and I don't want to waste it. And I've had older stuff licensed too, uh, where I'm like, nobody's going to Not nobody's going to want that, but, oh, maybe that's outdated or that's not my style or whatever. Yeah. Um, You know, I still, I, before I had an agent, I signed on with an agency in, um, I think it was 2018. But so what I would do is anytime anyone approached me to see my entire portfolio, I I didn't spend the time and effort in putting together a PDF portfolio that would have to be updated like literally every week because I create artwork all the time. I would just send them a link to my society six shop and I'd be like sort by new or bestsellers and you'll see a good reflection of my portfolio. And even today, like now my, the agency that represents me, they, they handle that part. They have all my stuff, you know, behind, um, behind an email, um, like lock screen and everything. But, uh, if it's another print on demand website, my agents don't handle that. I do. And if they reach out and they want to, um, like, like have me open up a print on demand site with them, um, usually what I'll do is I'll just send them a link to my society six shop and I'm like, okay, pick your top 50 or hundred favorites. And I'll just send you a Dropbox link and you guys can go upload it and, and I don't have to do anything. And so I, yeah. I still use Society6 as my my informal portfolio. That's a great way to do it. Yeah. And then you're not, you kind of take the pressure off of, you don't have to, because yeah, I do have that PDF portfolio and that can be a real pain <laughs> to have to yeah. update. You it know, just, it needs to be updated. Stuff. I have a brand book. And so I think this is something you're sending out um, to your audience after this call or maybe during but it's in my creative business bundle. 
and which is a it's it's a free download I have on my website, and it's a PDF of just all of these resources I use in my business, um, like Facebook groups that I've joined that have really strong communities for artists and um, surface designers, um, trend forecasting stuff like that. But also in this big chunky PDF called the Creative Business Bundle, um, I have a link to what my brand book actually looks like on my agent's website, and so it ha- it's not my entire portfolio; it's just uh, a PDF that is the best way to represent my brand. And so that's what gets sent out to um, brands and licensees that are interested in working with me. It's like, here's a, a snapshot of what, you know, the Cat Coke brand has to offer. And I yeah, update it's that like, about once a year. This is my aesthetic. Year. What do you think? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, it's updated once a year or two, just depending on how much new stuff I have to add to it. But um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's pretty helpful. It's great too, because then people can say, oh, if I want to license with her, this is the look that I'm going to get. Which is exactly. really great. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, I just wanted to, I know it's like, we went way over. I apologize. And if you need to go, please tell me, I'm just like, oh my God, I had so many things I want to ask you. Let's um, do a, let's do a one or two more good ones. Okay. So, well, you know what, let's go through. Cause I can always paste your answers. Um, I sent you, a, if, if everyone is wondering what I'm talking about, I sent Kat a list of questions and she answered them. So why don't you, like, if you want to look really quickly, if you have it in front of you, if not, no worries. What do you want to, what do you want to end on? And uh, it's funny, I see you highlighting it. And I definitely wanted to make sure you, you had a chance to share anything exciting that you're working on before we go. Um, Yeah, exciting stuff is I'm working on my latest uh, signature course, which is going to be about how to put together a collection from A to Z. Um, from brainstorming, concepting to actually execution and then how you market it. So that's what I'm working on now. So as I'm working on this collection I referenced earlier from my um, safari that I did in Africa, um, I was, I, I'm putting together the collection and I was like, hey, as I'm in the process of doing this, I'm just going to start a class outline talking about every step of the way as I work on this. So it's kind of like I'm putting together this collection for my agents, but then also making a class out of it at the same time. So it's been kind of fun. I'm like, oh, yeah. A lot more um, introspective, but um, yeah, so that'll launch at some point in 2024. Um, in the meantime, the, the I guess the freebie that I have for for your audience for you guys is my creative business bundle. And um, Carrie, I'm, I'm sure you'll you'll share a link to that somewhere. Absolutely. It's also okay. It's also on my website um, under freebies on the top header. You'll see a bunch of stuff. But um, I think the question that I could talk to that most people would find helpful today, especially in our current economic environment is you asked, do you have any tricks that help you uh, keep going even when things seem uncertain? And so that's one that um, whether you're a freelancer or surface designer, I mean, your your income is is almost never steady unless you have a full time salary job, which even then they could fire you at any moment. So that that was my fear with my salary job. I was like, there is no certainty here. Um, anyway, like my are in this industry, like our incomes kind of go like this month by month, and so there inherently is a lot of uncertainty. I know that December is usually my biggest month of the year because I are licensing, I sell products. Um, people are spending the most for the holidays. And so I know that like December um, is, is going to be a big one for me. So that's something I know I can always rely on. With our licensing, summer months are usually the driest. That's where I see the biggest dip through print on demand. Um, people just aren't buying as much as they are during the holidays. And so, yeah, there, there is a lot of inherent uncertainty in our industry, um, especially when uh, you realize that you have like one income stream that's earning you the vast majority of your income. If that dries up, like what what, what are you going to do? And so that's where um, I, I really focus on diversifying my income as much as humanly possible. So like with print on demand, when I realized that Spoonflower was working or sorry, Society6 was working well for me. I researched and found as many other print-on-demand websites as I could that had non-exclusives that I could just upload my artwork there to as well So to kind of buffer it out. So it's not all Society6, but I get you know a little bit more as well. Um, with licensing, that's awesome because I have, um, at this point, I may, maybe I have, I don't know, 20 or 30 or 50 maybe even like active licensing agreements that are happening right now with my agents. And so if one of those, like, let's say my wallpaper partner, let's say they they go bankrupt tomorrow and I stop earning income. 
that's that's a it's not great. I mean, they're they're a good chunk of my licensing income, but they don't represent all of it. And so, because I have those other you know twenty or thirty or forty licensees to rely on, it it helps me feel a little bit safer. Um, and then beyond that, I've also diversified into different industries. So, um, like I mentioned, I I teach online now, and so that's another way for me to diversify my brand, get personal fulfillment. And then also feel a little bit more secure in case something comes crumbling down. I mean, when when COVID, when all the lockdown things started in March of 2020, um, my art licensing income pretty much uh, dropped by 50% overnight because so many of my of my partners were selling in store and all these stores were closing down. And I had, you know, a lot of calls with my with my agents of like, when is this going to pick up again? When is this going to get better? And no one knew. Um, but what happened is because I had diversified my my income streams, um, the my online classes, like those, um, the, the income I earned from that started skyrocketing because everybody was stuck at home watching Skillshare classes, learning how to bake bread, like um, just doing things that they weren't normally doing. And so I was I was getting a raise in income there, even while my income was just completely being annihilated in our licensing. I mean, it's since come back and now it's, you know, full speed ahead, we're going well. But that that's just one example of how just unforeseen circumstances, if I were relying 100% on that art licensing income, it, it would have been really, really hard for me. So yeah, any way that you can to kind of diversify, um, without spreading yourself too thin. And so I mentioned prospecting earlier on, and I do a lot of that in my business. So it's it's like, what other what other things am I passionate about that I could maybe expand my brand into that aligns with uh, what I enjoy doing, something that could potentially um, become another income stream for me to just kind of diversify it, pad out the differences, things like that. So yeah, yeah, that that would be that would be my big advice is, um, try not to rely too heavily on just one thing. Um, see if you can spread out in a way that excites you. You know, is it, it is an exciting thing for your business that could also be profitable, that can also help you feel a little bit more secure, especially if you're getting to the point or already doing this full time. Yeah. And um, I will add to that too. So even within print on demand, um, I've noticed a cycle over the last few years that like, you know, of course, it, it kind of goes like this through the year. But then by December, you know, a lot of the print on demand, like products that people are buying, like mugs and, you know, laptop cases and things like that, um, go up in December. And then of course, they kind of take a little bit of a nosedive because everybody's got holiday hangover after spending yep. money on um, on presents. But a lot of my spoon flower sales right at the beginning of the year will start ramping up because a lot of people make New Year's resolutions to make more things or, you know, to, to like redecorate their house or yep. whatever. So a lot of the things that Spoonflower sells, which is another print on demand company, like wallpaper and fabric tend to actually, you know, pick up where those other products leave off. So I can watch my like Redbubble and Society6 do this at the beginning of the year, but then Spoonflower is kind of doing this. So it, it stays, it's not like necessarily way up here, but everything is relatively steady. So my print on demand income somehow levels out by spreading even my print on demand products across different types of, you know, categories. Like, cause you know, Spoonflower sells things for people to make you know, their own projects versus products that you're buying as a gift or whatever. Yeah. So yeah, even, it's really interesting. I've been watching the way that that works. Even so. just go like Googling, um, I don't know, a hundred ways to make money as an artist. And, mm -hmm. you know, maybe the vast majority of those don't appeal to you, but there's probably going to be some chunks in there that you're like, oh yeah, that's something that I could maybe explore. Like I used to sell my artwork at um, art show, like, um, like craft shows in Kansas City. Uh, like holiday markets and things like that. I'd rent out a booth and sell um, art prints and tote bags and, and all that jazz. And that was, and, and I really didn't enjoy doing it. It was just like, oh God, I would just want to like sit in my booth and read my book. And it, 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 was, it was not a fun way for me, but I, I wanted to try it. I wanted to see like, will I enjoy doing craft shows and art shows? Is it something that can, um, yeah, provide me a viable income to make it worth it? And it did, but then I, you know, I left the United States and now I'm nomadic. And so I don't have the supplies to, you know, do pop-up shows anymore. Plus I didn't really enjoy doing it in the first place. It was a lot of work, like 
hauling all that stuff in, setting it up. But it made me, um, yeah, it was, it was a nice chunk of income for me. And it was something early on in my days that I wanted to explore and see, like, is this something that has traction? I used to sell consignment. I'd go to stores in Kansas City with some product samples and be like, hey, would you like to sell these? I did like little pop-up booths in stores like Madewell or West Elm. Like on a Saturday, they let me set up a booth for free and just kind of sell products, things like that. So, you know, I was I was definitely trying out a lot of different things at the beginning of my business to see like what what was working, what was not working, what did I enjoy, what did I not enjoy? And I think that's a huge reason for the success I have today is even though I'm not doing some of those things anymore, like I'm no longer doing art shows, some of those things I tried out, um, one, I enjoyed and two, it became a profitable income source. So yeah, I would just say don't don't let your own, you know, limiting beliefs hold yourself back from anything that you're curious about trying. Put yourself out there because that's going to be the fastest way that you see success. Awesome. Thank you. That is such a great like thing to end on. It's such a like and it's so true. <laughs> you. you know, Thank it's you. like just believe in yourself and you know, just don't don't give up. That's my main thing. I always tell people, don't give up. Yes, things can get frustrating. We can be our own worst enemies, though. And oh, I just yeah. try not to listen to that little gremlin in my head. And I don't believe everything I think, because not everything that I think is actually true. <laughs> so absolutely. Um, so before we go, um, I would love and I'm going to share the links to your website and your creative business bundle, obviously. Thank you. But um, yeah, I don't know if you want to tell people really quickly where to find you and we will sign off. Yeah. Um, well, when you download my creative business bundle, uh, you'll be on my email list. And so that's where all the juicy stuff really comes in. I send weekly emails out every Tuesday um, with a creative prompt. And so what I do is I tie my basically like, oh, this week, draw a sunflower. And then we have a communal hashtag that we use, create with Cat Coke on Instagram. So you can browse through and see what everybody's doing. But um, what I do is I tie these creative prompts in with... Um, the kind of the insider scoop of art licensing. So it's not like draw sunflower because they're cute. It's draw sunflower because uh, these are incredibly on trend flowers. They're evergreen in your portfolio, like whether they're getting licensed in 2023 or 2043, sunflowers are still going to be relevant. And then I kind of give a, a quick explanation of what evergreen trends mean versus like hot trends. So um, yeah, so basically my weekly newsletter is just kind of inside the industry nuggets um, that kind of help you if you're interested in art licensing and surface design propel forward. And um, yeah, that's where all the juicy stuff happens. So um, you can get on that list by downloading the creative business bundle, or you can just go to my website, there'll be a pop up for joining my email newsletter. But that's um, whenever I have anything new to to launch like an art retreat or a new course or anything like that. I always tell my email newsletter students first. So that is the place to find me. Perfect. Well, thank you so much again. I know we ran over. I really appreciate you spending some valuable time sharing all this juicy information with us. I know everyone's really going to appreciate it. And um, I hope you continue to feel better and get over your, <laughs> your my pneumonia. Uh, pneumonia. Yeah. <laughs> my COVID is slowly getting better. I'm glad today my throat doesn't feel like it has razor blades in it. Excellent. So that's good. <laughs> Excellent. I've just been doing herbal tea all day. It's been yep. so great. Yep. Well, thank you so much for inviting me and everyone listening. I hope you got a lot of good value bombs and at the very least, some some motivation for moving forward. So I believe in you guys. Yeah. Thanks again, Kat. And Thank uh, you. Yeah, have a great 2024. It was great to talk to you. Thanks. You too, Carrie. Talk soon. Take care. Bye-bye.